Well, here we are again, and I'm uh, thrilled to be here uh, to encourage you uh, in your walk with the Lord and in your recovery. And uh, again, I welcome the other groups um, and is thrilled that you're here uh, joining us from the Tuesday group. And uh, yeah, just I pray that God will continue to work in your life to give you a sense of growth in him, as well as a victory over the challenges that you face. Um, just a little news flash, maybe a shameless commercial in one sense, but uh, so many people have been asking about these t-shirts that um, I just got an order in last week and uh, eight went already last week. Uh, so that's about... Uh, uh, 5% of them already sold in the first five days. But if you want one of these just for a keepsake, uh, they're, they're 20 bucks plus whatever it costs to ship it to you. Those in town, uh, you can just uh, let me know and stop by the office. I'll have it set aside for you. If you want one, no pressure. It's, it's, uh, it's once it's paid for the rest of the money goes to DFR anyway. So it's just, um, uh, yeah, it's just my life statement and it's, uh, fun to wear. Uh, all right. Um, I'm excited to talk to you about uh, this today because if Jesus was vulnerable, duh, you are vulnerable and I am vulnerable. You see, there's this amazing passage in Luke after the temptation of Jesus. We're going to break it down. But after the temptation of Jesus, it says that Satan left him for more opportune time, a time when it was to his advantage to come back and hit Jesus. So, so we got to ask ourselves, if Jesus had a vulnerable time, what might yours be? What might mine be? What would be the best time for the devil to tempt you? When are you at your weakest to face challenges and temptation? When are you most vulnerable? Now, the context of this passage is the temptation of Jesus. Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit for a time of testing. Uh, note, God is with him during this time of testing. Keep that in mind, that when you are facing temptation, God is with you because God was with Jesus the whole time. But Jesus had to take a stand over and over again. Um, so uh, he was fully alone which, of course, a lot of the time, our struggles happen when we are fully alone. Uh, but he was in the desert wilderness, fully alone, and no people around. And often, again, uh, alone is our hardest times. Um, and it was 40 days of testing, not a short time. And, um, and he ate nothing for that entire time. And obviously, uh, for many people, when they're hungry, it's part of the, the downturn towards you know, filling our appetite with something else. So he was starving and very weak. And there were three uh, different temptations that Satan threw by Jesus. One was for provision, one was for power, and one was for his protection. Um, and you'll see they all, they all worked at different angles of what could be perceived as weaknesses for Jesus. Provision, getting something, food, power, overseeing, you know, great um, parts of humanity and protection. Uh, the dangers would would save you if you threw yourself down off this uh, this uh, this high uh, tower, as it were. The one thing that is really fun to notice is that Jesus answered the devil every time with the verse of scripture. Kind of a back in your face, but he was quoting scripture. Don't you know that it says, and he'd quote scripture. Don't you know that it says, and he'd quote scripture. Don't you know that it says, and he'd quote scripture. And that in itself needs to be quite a lesson for all of us. Um, in my uh, my last year of college, um, I, uh, for about six months, um, I, became part of what's called the Bible Memory Association. And uh, you really had to learn virt virtually a verse a day. And at the end of the month, you had to go to somebody who would hold your book and you had to quote the entire 30 um, verses 
for that month. I mean, some of you might know it looks like uh, Curry kind of can quote a lot of scripture. Well, first of all, I've been doing it a lot longer than you, but there's been seasons where I had a really concerted effort to uh, to know scripture, uh, uh, to know it well. And uh, But that's not what the talk's about. Uh, it talks about if Jesus was vulnerable, you and I are vulnerable too. You say, what do you mean Jesus is vulnerable? Well, uh, let's, let's look at this in Luke chapter 4, verse 3. And this is the end of the story I told you about. At the end of the story of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. And it's kind of just a little, a little summary closing line at the end of the paragraph about the temptation of Jesus. It's, it's, a, it's a line that many people would just throw away because it's not the story. The story is the temptation and him using scripture. But you have this, and I've got six different translations uh, with this one verse in mind. So you kind of get the real feel for what it's saying. And so from Luke chapter 4, verse 13, the summary of the temptation of Jesus, we hear this. In the NIV, it says, when the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until an opportune time. The devil left Jesus for an opportune time, a time even better than this to kind of trip him up. From the Passion Translation, that finished the devil's harassment for the time being. So he stood off, as a, uh, off, as a, off at a distance, retreating until the time came to return and tempt Jesus again. The idea is coming back to tempt him again. From the English Standard Version. And when the devil had ended every temptation, so we have tempting, harassment, uh, temptation, the devil departed from him until an opportune time. Uh, from the message, we read this. That completed the testing. So now we have testing, temptation, harassment. Sounds like what we would face. The devil retreated temporarily, lying in wait for another opportunity, looking for another opportunity. And when the devil, in the Amplified, had finished every temptation, so there may have been others that weren't recorded here, just the three. He temporarily left him until a more opportune time. And then finally, from the Passion Translation, oh, uh, that uh, the, one, the one above uh, that says that finished Jesus' harassment, uh, no, actually, this bottom one. Anyway, one of them is New Living Translation. I apologize. I've got a typo here. Um, but that silenced the devil's harassment for the time being. He retreated until a more opportune time. So you get the feeling. The temptation was there. The, uh, the testing was there. The harassment was there. Uh, and it was there incessantly, day after day after day. And then when he realized he wasn't getting anywhere with Jesus, he temporarily left him. He pulled back for a time when he could maybe catch Jesus at a weaker moment. Now, if the devil's going to try to catch Jesus at a weaker moment, duh, he's going to try to catch you at a weaker moment. And so we have to ask the question, what is your more opportune time? Now, all of us on this call and all of us in the other groups, we all are uniquely different. We all, we all have different avenues where the enemy can come in. He would know our opportune time. Now, keep in mind that the uh, God is omniscient. He knows everything. But Satan is not omniscient, but he is a great observer. He sees what you do. When you struggle and fall, he goes, oh, I know. I see the sequence, this, this, and this. So I can get him or her by going this direction because then he will fall because he sees where you struggle. He sees your patterns. He sees your, temp uh, uh, your tendencies. But understand that, that uh, he's not omniscient and he's not omnipresent. He's not there seeing all of us at the same time. He is local. He, he's only one place at a time, but he has a lot of henchmen who do the same kind of work. So when is the best time for the devil to pull the trigger on you? The key is to know and understand your temptation triggers, your most vulnerable moments. 
where the enemy will attack you and you might succumb to your addiction again. You got to know your temptation triggers. You got to know your temptation triggers. You got to know what sets you off. You got to know when you are vulnerable. You got to know your more opportune time. That is a study that you need to be on. Now, a lot of you say, well, I can tell you right now what mine is. Well, that's good. A lot of you say, oh, I never thought of that. I, I, I just, you know, I, I'm so good right now. But no, listen, you got to be careful because when you get close to your most vulnerable zones, that's the time the enemy can uh, tempt you and create an opportunity. Of course, opportune uh, by definition, you all know, but it's uh, occurring at a favorable or useful time, obviously, to tempt you. Um, it's it's well timed for desired results, and so the enemy is timing it well to get the results of your failure. <laughs> The enemy knows our weaknesses and he knows our tendencies. And I didn't finish that line. I apologize if you're following in the notes. So, so I, I'm I'm going to stir your brain to think through what your most opportune time is. Now, this is incomprehensive, but it's a pretty thorough page on uh, you know what are uh, some of your temptation triggers. So I'm, I'm going to walk through them. And, and uh, you need to be doing some thinking. And again, this is not exhaustive, but it, it's, it's, it's certainly directional to help you understand what your more opportune time might be. So there's dangerous dispositions. You got to know your emotional triggers that unsettle you inside. What's going to unsettle you inside? These are emotional triggers. And these are all feelings where you feel attacked and criticized by somebody. You might feel rejected or excluded by somebody. You start to get angry and resentful. Uh, sometimes when you feel blamed and accused, especially if it's unjustly, then you can get into a, a sulking bad place. Sometimes just being lonely or isolated, that's a dangerous disposition. If you're wounded by somebody or offended by somebody, sometimes that's the dangerous disposition and becomes an emotional trigger. Sometimes if you feel like a failure or you have failed, then you just, what's the point? And you just repeat the failure cycle. Um, or if you feel that you're falling short, you, you feel, well, what's the point? You know, you get into this bad place. Sometimes people uh, get into this self-pity thing or they play the victim card and, and that just makes them weaker where they just make excuses. And this just touches the surface of a host of other unsettling emotions. Now, some of you have heard this before, uh, and, and it's not exhaustive, but it doesn't hurt to know it. With regard to temptation, you've got to remember, and this helps many guys, so the word halt. Halt is an acrostic for hungry, angry, lonely, tired. And for many people that struggle with addictions, if you're hungry, physically hungry, if you're angry, if you're lonely, if you're tired, those are all for emotional dispositional liabilities that could make you vulnerable for temptation. So, um, yeah, so those are some of the dangerous dispositions, the emotional triggers. Now we're going to look at the visual triggers, what you see, what you sense. And these are deadly distractions. We had dangerous dispositions, now deadly distractions. You got to know your visual triggers that sidetrack your focus. See, sidetrack your focus. Uh, key, key thing is uh, sidetrack your focus because um, I, I've been meeting for uh, 41 years out of my 50 years married with another man to hold me accountable. And I've been meeting with uh, Larry, my accountability partner, for 33 years. We'll meet again tomorrow. But but we call each other to greatness, by, but this is what I want to focus on. I want to become the best man I can be, according to God, the best husband, the best father, the best grandfather, and do the best in my work that I can. That is my focus. And Larry would have the same. And so we call each other and push each other toward that focus. We don't let the other one get sidetracked on other crazy things. But what happens is there's these deadly distractions. There's visual things that might get you sidetracked. And of course, there might be tempting, attractive people at work, uh, maybe at a restaurant or club you go to or a bar. Sometimes I wonder, what are you doing going to a bar? It's likely not the best. I'm not saying you can't have a drink. 
but be careful. Um, there's people that flirt with you. If somebody, uh, you know, feels warm to you, all of a sudden that person has caught your eye, caught your interest. Um, sometimes you're with friends that push the limits and how they talk trashy and, and how they joke. Uh, sometimes friends send porn images or jokes as part of a thread. And of course, all you got to do is have a visual distraction and you get going, right? Um, I mean, there's obviously sexual images everywhere in the advertising, on magazines, uh, uh, you know, on TV, especially anything past nine o'clock at night. There's sexual images everywhere. Uh, sometimes you're out in public and you find yourself cruising to look, to see, to imagine opportunities, uh, frankly, to look for skin, for uh, bellies, butts, and boobs. You know, I mean, like, you, you got to be careful uh, when you're in public. That's why we talk about the second long look kills. It, it's one thing to notice an attractive woman, but it's a second thing to go to do the one up and down and, you know, follow her down the the uh, the, the mall, uh, you know, concourse. Um, uh, be, be really careful on... Uh, cruising or uh, frankly just scoping uh, women or scoping uh, people that are a temptation to you uncontrolled in public places when there's crowds of people and uh, uh, your eyes are just looking for opportunities to land uh, that's a really dangerous distraction or sometimes just surfing aimlessly online almost like on a hunt and you know that oh i was just vegging i was just whatever but the, the more you circle around circle around to get something more edgy then you click on it then it goes from there to boom you're in it already and uh sometimes it's revisiting restaurants with uh scantily crad uh, scantily scantily dressed or uh, sexually provocative staff and um yeah um uh, I, I'm amazed at some of the restaurants uh, uh, Christian people agree to go to. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, they're like, there's dangerous or deadly distractions there. So that's the visual triggers. And of course, you could add a lot more. I've just given a few. But you got to start thinking, okay, well, what are my emotional triggers? What's the worst dispositional state that I'm in when I'm tempted, uh, when, it's, when it's a battle? Uh, you also got to ask, okay, what about um, uh, visual triggers? What situations I'm in that are tempting? And then when do I have diminished discernment? Situational triggers, I call them that awaken dark distractions. Um, so uh, what's the situation when you are tempted the most? Uh, maybe it's late night at home alone. Uh, maybe it's, uh, you know, going clubbing if you're single or as if you're single. I can't believe of um, people are away, you know, with work. And yeah, after the seminar or the day's event, you might go for dinner with a few colleagues and then they want to go to a bar or a, or a club. And, you know, I mean, like, hello, uh, there's a situation that you could uh, just say, no, uh, I'm going back, you know, call my family or whatever. Um, if you're having marital struggles, it creates some unclear thinking and rationalization that, you know, my marriage isn't working anyway, so why have these boundaries or whatever? Um, sometimes there's a specific time of day that's connected to a past pattern of acting out. And so, you know, certain times of day, you, you, uh, you got to be aware of those past patterns of how you acted out and uh, you got to push through those. Um, for many, it's, um, I have to reclaim the bathroom, uh, because of past addictive routines that were related there. And, uh, so, you know, that could be a situational trigger. Um, you find yourself restless and you can't sleep. There's a situation that, uh, many people have succumbed to the PMO cycle. Um, uh, there are certain streets or districts of your community that you maybe uh, used to drive by uh, just to to flirt with danger. And then, you know, I've had men who drive down certain streets and don't approach anybody, but go into an alley near and visualize and, and masturbate, you know, privately in their vehicle. Like, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, be careful on locations that are a problem. Uh, you may be weaker if you're under the influence of drug or alcohol, uh, uh, marijuana, uh, that could weaken your resolve to stay clean. 
Uh, what are other situational triggers? Of course, we talked about a, a bar, a club, an adult entertainment establishment. What are you doing? Uh, maybe uh, digital privacy, or you're using VPN where you're you're virtual and and you know nobody kind of sees where you're at or where you've been. Um, there's there's an attempt to be private in a situation there, even though you're at home on your computer or at work on your phone. In some cases, if you're, again, the halt, hungry, sleepless, or maybe even sick, if you're bored, if you're purposeless, aimless, listless, those are situations where it's dangerous. And even alone for extended period of time, I got, I got men whose wife and kids are going to visit her parents and they're home for four days alone. And they already go, oh my goodness, I'm at home four days alone. And they know that they likely won't make it to the third day unless they get support, unless they reach out. And so that extended period of time can be complicated. And uh, you got to know your most vulnerable environments and places. Sometimes you're, you're creating a situation where you're going to be triggered. If you refuse accountability, you have private passwords, you turn off location services, uh, you're creating a situation where you're going to be vulnerable. Now, there's just a smattering of dispositions, distractions, and uh, situational triggers, emotional, visual, and situational triggers. And uh, just so you know, uh, a whole talk could be on this next one, uh, mental triggers, or what is your danger zone? And with its fantasizing, daydreaming, and idle mind, there's no focus, lazy, bored, vegging, aimless surfing online, and having fading biblical input where you're struggling and you haven't read your Bible for a while, uh, there, there's a lot of mental triggers that I haven't even talked about. And uh, yeah, so, so, so you got to understand, and uh, I use the words, face it, if the devil knows a more opportune time to tempt Jesus. You know he has the book on you. You know he has the book on you. You got to be sure that you know your own triggers better than the enemy does. You have to know your own triggers better than the enemy does. So when you start getting close to those five or six things off this list or other things, but you got to know your triggers better than the enemy does. And then you are wise to share those triggers with your accountability partner, with your counselor, uh, and maybe even with your spouse, even though we don't want your spouse to be your watchdog. It's interesting. We've talked here a lot about the devil tempting Jesus. But... You can't always blame the devil. You can't always blame the devil. So first of all, don't flatter yourself that you're such a target that the devil's trying to get you all the time. You're not Jesus. So be careful to think that, yeah, you, 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 you're, 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 you're battling the enemy yourself. Because there's other things. Uh, you see, we fool ourselves in recovery because pride comes before a fall. We think we've got this. And of course, you know from... Proverbs uh, 16, 18, first pride, then the crash. The bigger the eagle, the harder the fall. NLT says pride goes before destruction, the crash. And haughtiness, another word for pride, before a fall. So you don't fool yourself in recovery because, uh, first of all, uh, you can be tempted. And, uh, and, and, and if you're not humble, vigil, Aware, knowing your triggers, uh, you know, you could be fooling yourself and pride comes before a fall. And so don't flatter yourself, don't fool yourself, and finally don't forget yourself because it's our own desires unchecked that drag us into temptation. Hear that again. It's our own desires unchecked that drag us back into temptation. This is right out of James chapter 1 says this, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, temptation, testing, perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So battling temptation says, I love Jesus. Not a bad thing to keep in mind. 
When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. God is tempting me. Okay, so no, no. God cannot be tempted by evil himself, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are, notice, dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. So we have evil desires that we need to continue to surrender to the Lord, not just the sexual addiction, lots of evil desires. The desire to have people look at you in a good way. So we exaggerate, we embellish stories, we, we envy other people, we, we wish we had what they had. Uh, you know, we, um, you know, we lie, we don't tell the truth, right? But, but, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it is full grown gives birth to death. There is nothing more miserable. Stay with me on this one. There is nothing more miserable than a guy who got some victory coming to regroup, decides he's got it figured out, discontinues coming to regroup, and I run into him, and in a private moment, I say, how you doing on your addiction? And the countenance falls, and, and he is back and even struggling worse. It feels like a piece of garbage. And remember, regroup doesn't fix everything, but I'll tell you what. Coming to a group like this where you have like-minded people battling for the same thing, talking through issues that really help you over and over and over again, this is a place where you have the opportunity to grow because each person is tempted when they're dragged away from their own, uh, dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. And it destroys you if you let the addiction continue to have its way. You'll lose everything that's important to you. So reality check. Just a reminder, if Jesus was vulnerable, you are vulnerable. So what to do to decrease the power of your opportune times of temptation? Here's a few suggestions of what you can do. Uh, and these are just a few. Uh, you'll have other ones that even are better for you than this. But figure out on paper. See, that's really intentional. I want you to Type it out on your screen. I want you to write it out in a whatever. But figure out on paper, what are your emotional, visual, and situational triggers towards temptation? You've got to do that. You've got to know, well, okay, these are my emotional. These are the dangerous locations and, you know, destinations that are a problem. Okay, so, but, but you've got to do that. And you've got to, number two, share these triggers with a friend so that your temptation tendencies are known. And then they go, hey, hold on, hold on. Uh, you're going where? Isn't that one of your trigger situations? Yeah, excuse me. Uh, tell me, how are you feeling right now? Oh, and, and he, you, you share that you're feeling, oh, one of your emotional triggers. You see, your accountability partner can, can observe when you are blinded, where you're minimized. Oh, no, no, I'll be fine going there. I'll be fine. No, 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 no. If it's a situational trigger that is a problem to you, you still may have to go someplace, maybe it's for work or whatever, but you have to tell your accountability partner and you check in. How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? Uh, three, use the relapse report. Now, I'm not wanting you to relapse, but you might as well learn from your mistakes. If you do relapse, more deeply try to understand your bad habit, what's going on that leads to failure. And so when I when I ask guys that I'm counseling to listen, if you struggle, then do a relapse report so we can look at it and start to see tendencies and patterns. All right. And so and, and this is um, an extension of that. It's beyond the relapse report. I, for years, I've been telling people to to uh, consider doing a three week temptation analysis where you record everything that happens from the time you get up till you go to bed at night. And you record your activities and you look for patterns and habits and where you're having breakdowns. Where you're, okay, this is when I was tempted the most. Go back, what was going on before that? And you start to analyze times of day, emotional dispositions, uh, visual distractions. Where were you when this happened? You see, uh, so to do a, a, a three week, every hour recording, how are you doing? What's going on inside? Uh, and of course, 
to live wisely, you'd be wise to analyze your thoughts. Often we know that we're slipping, but we don't say anything and we don't do anything. We, we, we know we're slipping. We know we're not doing as good as we were two months ago. We know we're in a bad place and we remain quiet. Like, wake up, wake up. If you, if you, if you know your thoughts and you can feel the slide happening, hey, hey, guys, hey, hey, yeah, pray for me. I, I've been on a bit of a slide the last three days and I, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing well. I'm sensing my triggers getting bigger. Wow, wonderful. Um, number six, regular accountability. Weekly. You reach out when you're tempted. And, and others can help you identify your opportune times because you shared what they are. And you reach out when you're tempted. I cannot believe how many times when people are tempted and struggling, they do not reach out or in their mind they don't have anybody to reach out to nobody really cares and all this stuff right no 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 you have a phone right matter of fact i tell people when you're tempted especially when you're alone move towards people any people you're not going to act out in starbucks you know what i mean like like you, you, you can you can move towards people, but reach out when you're tempted. And regular accountability helps do that, especially when you share what your temptation triggers are. And, and of course, we've had whole talks on this one, but you got to face your inner dark voice and your soul wounds. Now, soul wounds are hurts that have happened in your life that, that leave you vulnerable if you don't deal with them. And you have this inner dark voice that says you're not enough, that you're a failure, that you're never going to make it out of this anyway, right? And so you got to face the inner dark voice and deal with your soul wounds. And remember, if Jesus defeated the devil by quoting scripture over and over again, duh, know your Bible better. You should be able to quote scripture at will when tempted. And, uh, you know, that um, uh, I have a recovery scripture reading that you're supposed to read every day for about uh, 17 minutes a day it takes. And you read it every day for uh, 30 days. And then you read it once a week after that. And, uh, and you're supposed to choose a, a number of verses off that list to memorize. That would be really good. Even to get that handout and, and underline all those verses in your Bible and just put the word recovery or R beside it if you want. But uh, yeah, know your Bible better. Uh, so you can quote scripture at will when you're tempted. Uh, and there's a few more scripture about temptation that I'll just comment on as we head towards closing this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, but Jesus said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. And Paul goes on to say, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. He will admit them. I, look, I struggle. I got weaknesses. I get temptation triggers. By identifying them, by admitting them, by not pretending I got it all together and there's nothing that would ever tempt me again, I'm doing so good, that's dangerous turf. But Paul says there I will boast, I will own, I will share more gladly my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest upon me. And it goes on to say, because when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, vulnerable, open, and telling people I'm struggling, then I am strong because others and Jesus can support me. And I say, Jesus, I need you. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, no temptation has overtaken anyone, you, except that's common to other people. I understand that, like, oh, you don't understand my temptation. It's so hard and so different than others. Baloney. No temptation is overtaking you ex ex except which is common to mankind. And God is faithful. Disclose your temptation triggers. 
Disclose your struggling emotional disposition. Disclose to Jesus. Jesus, help me right now. Reach out to others. Call a friend. Text a friend. You break the silence to break the power of the temptation. So you reach out to somebody. Even saying in a text of three or four brothers, just so you know, I need your prayer. I'm struggling right now. That admission breaks the silence. God is faithful. He will not let you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can endure it. I would argue that if you've attended regroup for three months, even, you have the way out. You have the way out. You know your triggers and you know the plan to get out of it. You have the way out. God has already revealed to you the way out so that you can endure the temptation, so you can not succumb to it. You can fight it off. See, here's the problem, though. You can't embrace the temptation and embrace Jesus at the same time. The temptation is there to be tempted, and I can't move towards the temptation. I have to move towards Jesus. Because if you embrace the temptation, Jesus can't get in between you and the temptation because you're moving in that direction. You're not taking steps to say, Jesus, help me. Call a friend. Read scripture. Quote scripture out loud. And finally, uh, in Hebrews chapter 4, 15, we do not have a high priest, Jesus, who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses. So he can empathize. Why? But we have one high priest, Jesus, who was tempted in every way, just as we are. He was human. He was tempted in every way we are, yet he did not sin. I mean, some of the, the women that supported the disciples that, that fed and, you know, even paid out of their own means. You know, some of them were ex-prostitutes. Uh, one lady used to be the head of a brothel, you know, I mean, like these are complicated women that you could say, oh, wow, we know where she's been before. I bet this would be easy. And your mind could go there. Well, Jesus had all these temptation situations around. Jesus gets our battle. He lived our battle. He will lead the way out if you allow him to. But never forget, if Jesus was vulnerable, so are you and I. Know your temptation triggers. Share your temptation triggers. Go to Jesus on your temptation triggers. It'll make all the difference in your recovery victory. Amen.